Good morning and welcome to the Seed Center. I'm Brian Bean, Parish Administrator here in Calcasieu. We are excited to be here today. This is an important milestone in our drainage or stormwater management process, which has many moving parts. Today we are excited to uh, hear from some, uh, several of our consulting firms working on this as far as watershed planning. And when I say it's high tech, that's, that's an understatement. We are getting cutting edge technology and very good expertise on stormwater management. So we will get into that shortly. I just want to make a couple of points here. Um, we are going to be taking a break about midway uh, and then we will come back after lunch is served, but we will have a time, plenty of time for question and answer. Uh, but I, I want to take a moment briefly uh, to introduce who wants to give a few comments, Dennis Scott. Dennis is our police juror who is the chairman of the drainage committee. Come on up, Dennis. I just want to say something before I turn it over to him. You, you cannot ask for a better champion on this issue than Dennis Scott. He is tireless. He is motivated, he is passionate, he listens closely to people, and he is he's a great ambassador for doing things better in the future here in our great state. So uh, it is not just a appointed position for him, he's, he is very much into it, and we are so glad of that. So please welcome Dennis Scott. I won't have to stand right up on the microphone because I do tend to talk a little loud. It might be a one of those issues that I'm trying to overcome something, maybe, I'm not quite sure, but I just want to welcome you all here today. You know, several years ago when we started talking about drainage watersheds, it becomes something that we're actually looking at as where we want to go in the future and how we want to get there. Well, today, this is now a tool of where we want to go and how we want to get there. When we start talking about having a resilient community, it's very important to understand that there's more than just figuring out how to manage water. When we learn how to manage water, we're going to be able to begin to access all of the things that we need to know in this community, which is where are our vulnerable areas at? Where are our assets at? What does our infrastructure do? What is the quality of our infrastructure? We are doing in this community what others in this state and in this nation would love to be able to do. We are putting cutting edge technology, hard work and tax dollars into becoming more resilient. How do we become more resilient? We have to identify the areas that we know we can fix. So in the future, what we are now putting together right here with this great team, we are building what is gonna be able to draw down federal dollars. We're now gonna, instead of looking at everything individually, how do we take the environment? How do we take economic development? How do we take social, our social economics into play? How do we begin to blend all of that? Because we will have to put together a long-term recovery plan. That's what's happening in the nation right now. Communities are beginning to understand if I don't plan for the things that are going to happen, then I'm, I'm failing my community. This technology and the things that it's identifying for us is going to guide that process. Other communities are trying to do a long-term plan without the information that we have. We are in the forefront of this nation. When this summer, when we go to our national convention, our engineers and our, some of our team is going to go to, they want, they're tired of me talking about it at the national level, we're going to go and present them what we're putting together right now and they're going to understand this is where you want to be but if you don't do the small things right now the ordinance issues if we don't take care of some of our rain gauges that we begin to do years ago there's a lot of small things our gis system if the federal government doesn't recognize that every community needs a gis system this can never take shape watershed planning uh, i just left a conference last week to where this southwest louisiana we've now put together a team that's beginning to work towards building a partnership with beauregard jeff davis vernon parish cameron calcasieu all of us as a southwest louisiana watershed authority we now have a plan to go in a t and to physically touch base with all of the policy makers and within 18 months we're believing that that effort is going to then dovetail into these things to grow this watershed we can work on calcasieu parish but if we don't understand that the water is shedding from as far away as Dallas, 
So now we're talking national levels. Those are the things that we have to begin to look at a big picture and not just focus on how do we fix Calcasieu. But when we fix Calcasieu, we're going to help this entire nation. So thank you for all that you're doing today. Thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing all of the things that come out of Miss Mayo, Shelly Mayo. We have Mr. Hal McMillan here today with us, police jurors. They make the tough decisions. Those are the things that we have to do as jurors every day. I can have a ditch dug pretty easy nowadays. We can work on those things, but the big ticket items, how do we understand that what we're putting our money towards is worth it? Because some people would say, is it? Well, if I don't know where the vulnerabilities are of this parish, I'm spending tax dollars on something that I can't protect later. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. John Hornsby, and she's going to take it from here. Thank you for your hard work. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Um, we're going to go ahead and just dive right in right now. Just a couple of housekeeping things. On your table is a sheet. If you have questions, we've got a lot to go through this, this morning. Um, go ahead and jot down your questions there. We'll try and get to everybody, but that is another way to, to record your questions. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, so a couple of key staff. So our team was uh, came together about May, in which we started on this drainage initiative. Um, and about a year ago, we actually teamed with the Water Institute and Del Taras and started the real-time flood forecasting. So a couple of our key staff members that have been participating, uh, Butch Babineau out of our Lake Charles office with Finstamaker, um, myself, Jean Hornsby. Um, in addition, we've got Jim Geisler with CSRS. Um, a couple of our other key staff members that are here are Allison Bordelon, uh, Eric White, and Ehab Maselli with, Finst uh, sorry, with the Water Institute. Um, a couple of things, our presentation outline today, a brief introduction, then I'll be turning over the presentation to Dr. Ehab Maselli, who's going to give you an overview of real-time forecasting and the pilot study that's been completed on the contraband bayou here in Calcasieu Parish. Um, this is the first of the, this kind in the state, and he's going to go over kind of how this framework works, as well as show you all some of the animations and how it can be used for this community. Um, then I'm going to give you a quarterly update on your parish-wide regional watershed plan um, and strategic analysis. And then we're going to wrap up the app this morning with uh, Danica Adams with the Office of Community Development who's going to give you all an overview of the Governor Edwards Watershed Initiative for the state. So many mornings we wake up, your phone goes off, there's alerts. We get things for, all right, there's a flood watch. There's a flood warning. We often start looking at our radar, and everybody's got their, their phone and their apps that tell them, okay, this is how much rain's coming. Um, right now, Alan and I were looking this morning about the tropical, the hurricane that's coming through and it's going to likely produce rain in the next few weeks. So these are all things that people commonly do. But what does it mean? You know, I often hear from people, what does it mean when like, somebody says, hey, the Sabine is going to crest at 31.5 feet? What does it mean? You know, we often show people this or we say, hey, we're going to get eight inches of rain in the next 24 hours. What does that mean to me? What does that mean to the person that lives on Bro Street or on Ryan Street? What does that mean to that person? Those days often result in headlines that look like this, where we're rescuing people out of their homes, where we've got flooded streets. Do we cancel school? Do we not cancel school? These are questions that we often have based on these warnings, but we have the technology now. Calcasieu Parish has done a great job of investing over the last 10 years on LIDAR, in hydraulic modeling, in a gauging system, in policy. All of these things have gotten you to where you are today. They've set you up so that you can look at these advanced technologies. And we can now look at what's called real-time forecasting. So this endeavor started about a year ago. Um, Post 2016, you know, a lot of people were, we actually, after the storms, you know, people were reactive. But could we have been better prepared? Um, Ehab came to us and said, Calcasieu Parish is set up to look at this technology. They've invested. Let's go ahead. So we came to y'all 
y'all were like, hey, this sounds great. So y'all also outsourced some other funding sources from the Port of Lake Charles, um, City of Lake Charles, uh, Mr. Keith DeRusso, and Calcasieu Parish all came together and we started off on this journey. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ehab Maselli now, who's gonna give you a little bit about the program, what it can be used for, and what the next steps are. Well, good morning, everybody. I looked at my watch just to make sure that I still can say good morning, uh, still before noon. Um, thank you, John. I think that John really laid it out really well in terms of what is the benefit of developing this system here. Um, and I um, reiterate again that Calcasieu Parish is probably, um, in my opinion, probably the most progressive parish in the entire state in terms of planning and thinking ahead. It's the only parish that I know of that had that level of Gauging in terms of rainfall stage, uh, it it's really was primed to develop this, and I don't think that there's any other parish in Louisiana that has their own forecasting system. While we still have it only at a pilot location, the plan is to actually extend it parish-wide, so it's really outstanding. Um, I will walk through some of the details of the system, how it works, what kind of information it provides, what is the information that is being fed to it, and how it functions and then I will be happy to answer any questions for you. Why do we need to have a flood warning system? Because the National Weather Service already gave us a flood warning information. The federal government gives us information at a very high level in the sense that it, it's not detailed enough to, for people who are in a specific neighborhood, they would know what the, that information translates to their own neighborhood and their own street. And that's what we are trying to do here is to actually connect with the tools and the capabilities that the federal government developed so we do not duplicate or redo stuff that is already being done by, by federal funds. We actually hook up our system to it so that we can cascade from the high level information all the way down to neighborhoods and, and streets. And that's the, that's the value of this flood warning system that the parish is embarking on so that we can actually go down to the neighborhood level. What would it help with? Actually, we'll have information about potential flooding days ahead of time to the street level. So we would have an opportunity to know about the areas that are vulnerable. The recorded. Okay. Thank you. Um, you can move people to safety ahead of time because you will have a lot of time, a lot of lead time to react and respond. Uh, you can actually help provide information to emergency responders. Um, and ultimately you can also reduce the damage. You will not be able to solve drainage problem two, three days ahead of time or anything like this, but you will be able to react and prepare and respond in a much better way. You will also have an idea about where are the areas that are vulnerable. So even if you want to issue warnings, you don't have to do it parish-wide. We all saw the conflict and the challenges that Houston faced last year. The governor was conflicting with the city mayor on where to evacuate, and they were thinking that they need to evacuate millions of people. Had they had detailed information, they probably would have realized that you don't need to evacuate the entirety of the Houston area with millions of people. If you actually had detailed information that are reliable, you probably would have zoomed it down and narrowed it down to maybe hundreds of thousands instead of millions, and it probably would have been doable. And a lot of people would have avoided a lot of this damage that we saw. So, a lot of entities are moving into that direction, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually really good to see Calcasieu actually having a lead uh, on a lot of people. The approach that we followed, um, again, we tried to leverage funds as much as possible. We linking our local system with other federal pieces. The National Weather Service have a lot of products that are public, that they are available. We grab that from, the, from online and feed it to our local system. Uh, the National Water Service also have now a national water model. It's a really awesome model, but again, it's at the national level. We are going to hook up to it. Um, and then we get also information from, from the coast uh, so that we can have surge and tide information hooking up to our system. The overall philosophy here is to extend the forecasting from high level details all the way down. Uh, like John mentioned in, in the 2016 flood, I live in Lafayette. They had probably only one or two locations in the entirety of Lafayette, which is Surrey Street. Living in my home, I don't know what that means. When they tell me that Surrey Street is going to crest, I don't know if my neighborhood is going to crest or not. I don't know. 
And that will be the value that you can provide to the constituents and the residents. How does it work? We actually grab data. The data import is the first piece. So we go online, grab all the forecasting, because the federal government already gave us rainfall forecasting, wind, tides, and gulf surges. So we grab all that, and then we run the, the local drainage model. These are the same models that the parish have invested in already. These are the hydrology and the channel models that you already invested in, that you already use for your FEMA maps, is the same engines. We don't create new engines. We use the exact same engines and then we provide output. That output can be something that you will view in your computer. We are actually working that you can also send information via your, your cell phone. So uh, there will be a lot of communication details in here in terms of the output. So these are the three main pieces. Grabbing the stuff from online, use the same engines that we already have, and then we disseminate information. And you will have information five days, four days, three days ahead of time. How reliable that output is exactly as reliable as the rainfall forecast that you see. Sometimes when it's five days out, it's going to have a lot of uncertainty in it. But when they tell you that it's going to rain tomorrow or it's going to rain six hours from now, it's pretty reliable. So the level of confidence we have also increases with time as it gets closer and closer. The output that we will produce will look something like this. Uh, does it have a laser? OK, that's all right. Um, so we always go back in time, so we hind cast when we look at, let's say, last week and then next week. The value of going back in time, because we can actually compare the model output to actual observation. And if there are differences between them, then we would know that our models need to be improved and fine-tuned. And then we forecast into the future. So you will always have that seven-day forecast. And then you can, you can have an idea about what, is pos what are the possibilities. If you see that there may be a flood event coming three days from now, then you, you need to start to prep for it. Uh, so that's, the, that's how the system works. How do we actually uh, set it up a little bit more in detail? So for, this is the pilot location, which is the contraband bayou. We grab the atmospheric forecasting from the National Weather Service, which mean wind and rain. We also uh, get information from um, the, the NOAA and the USGS coming in from the Gulf. So we have, if, it, if there are any surges or tides, we grab that as well. And then we couple all that with the federal pieces in there. And then we run our local models and spit out information. It looks like a lot, um, if you're dealing with GIS, the system actually, if you open it in your computer, looks very similar to that. It has a map and it has locations in there and it allows you to query information from it. These are the kind of outputs um, and how the system works in there. So the data that we, that uh, on the external forecast input, as I said, we get precipitation, stage information, um, information from the Gulf area so that we can capture that, that piece of it. And then we get the rainfall from um, the, the, the local uh, National Weather Service, either here in the charts or the one in, uh, in Slidell. And then we run the HMS and the rest. These are the channel and the, and the hydrology models. And then we provide the output. This, I'm going to scroll through these outputs. And then I will get to the, uh, a, a little bit more of the visuals. But here you can actually, uh, these slides will be available. Yes. Yeah. So, so we, these are a little bit more details in terms of how actually the, the system dynamics work. I'm going to skip in a lot of these pieces. This is an image showing the gauges that the Calcasieu Parish installed, which is pretty, pretty substantial. It's really great. Um, and then we have some USGS gauges as well that we use. Um, these are the map layers that are inherently part of the system. I'm going to skip into a lot of these pieces. Uh, this is an output from the gauge. One of the gauges in there, you have the rainfall and the, and the little uh, brown color, and then the stage is shown right below it. This is, uh, this is a output from the USGS gauges. I'm going to skip through those quickly. This is another driver. Um, so we have um, the wind, and rainfall information. This is the surge from the Gulf. So we capture that as well. So we get all the atmospheric drivers. And then this is the model of the channel and all the details in it. Uh, this is rainfall that we use, uh, whether it's for the past week or the future week. Um, and this is the output in terms of how much water 
that was generated as a result of that rainfall. We take that and feed it into the channel model, and you get you come up with something like this. So at certain locations within the pilot, uh, the contraband bayou, you will have a, a hindcast of the stage and also a forecast. And then the parish gave us specific locations that they said, okay, if the water exceeds those thresholds, then we, we need to have a warning. So actually, the system that we set up right now, we have several locations, whether a road gets over top or a specific <coughs> location is gonna get flooded, then a message gets sent to their, to their uh, cell phone. Uh, this is an output again showing the, um, the, the week before and the future week, and we have some backup plans in there. If one of the gauges go out, we switch from one gauge to another. I'm gonna skip again some of these details. Here is another image showing the forecasts um, and at a specific location that are of interest. This is comparing the model to the gauge data. Uh, this is one location where the actual model uh, did a pretty good job matching the data. And if it didn't, then we have an opportunity to go to improve the model. This is another location. And this is a map that the system provides. So this information here, the parish will have it several days ahead of time. So they will have days ahead of time showing potential flooding in certain areas, and they will have a depth. How much is the water depth on top of each of these locations? So uh, they will be able to, um, to, to process this data uh, with a lot of lead time for them to respond. We also generated, um, this is just a list of all the parameters. I'm gonna skip to actually show something that is a lot more visual. They actually also will get something like this in a Google uh, Earth map and showing the potential flooded area. This is information that you don't get it after the fact. This is information that you will get it ahead of time. So they will be able to tell that Okay, this neighborhood here is, is likely to flood. We need to do something about it. And that is the value of this system. Um, and they can generate that on hourly or a few times a day, but they will have it several days ahead. And they can keep their eye on it to make sure that this is really likely to happen. Then they can have several options to respond. And whether they want to advise people to evacuate or whether they want to at least move some properties, they would need to communicate that to emergency responders. There's a lot of value of knowing this well ahead of time. And it's a lot more detailed than the federal government would allow us to have because they have to cover the entire country so it's understandable that their resolution is much coarser. They stay at a high level. We need to take that all the way down to our streets and neighborhoods. Um, we actually have a forecast for yesterday, right? It was a high Yeah, so can we uh, play it? I would show this one. So this is the latest forecast that we just generated yesterday. No, it's a high, high, high. It's only a high cap. But this is a small event, so it's uh, we didn't have any flooding coming out of the channels, but it's still good to see that. And then I will play another event where areas were flooded. So this specific event, the water was still contained in the channel, so it's good, no, nobody flooded. But this is the kind of information, the flyover information that parish personnel will have it. You can keep an eye on it and you can, you can download it periodically to see it as often as the system is designed to. We, we have control over how often you want to produce this kind of information. All right, I'm gonna go to the other event. I think you got the idea here. This is a historical event that actually did have a lot of areas that were flooded. I think it was May 2016? Yeah. Yes. 
So this is the information I imagine that if we have this information days ahead of time and we have information about the areas that are going to actually flood and you can see that there were a lot of homes that got flooded. Okay, so while we're watching this, I just wanted to um, add that the system now is actually hosted, although it's hosted at the Water Institute, the parish personnel actually have full access to it so that they can actually run it themselves, they can query information out of it, um, so they have, they have full access to it. Um, we can actually migrate and uh, we did some training to, for them on how to use it. So uh, they, have, they have the ability to run, they have the ability to query information, um, and if there are some improvements, then we will have to communicate with the parish on how to execute that. But um, it, it is residing at the Water Institute, but they have a node here um, in the parish with, with full access to the system. So this is, it gives you a summary of what the system is about and what kind of information. So it gives us stage information, it gives us water depth, um, a lot of details um, at, the, at the pilot location contraband. Since the framework and the system have been designed and we've already went through all the details with the parish, extending that parish wide is going to be a much smoother process because we've already gone through the steps and they've already uh, gone through what kind of information they want. So a lot of these programs have been developed already and designed for to satisfy their needs. So extending that parish wire is, is definitely going to be a much smoother process, especially that we already are, are upgrading the models and we're having a lot better topographic information. So extending it parish wire is going to be a smooth process. So that concludes the, the uh, do you want to hold questions until the end? Um, we can actually ask, answer questions regarding this section um, now. One of the things I want to point out, um, when Eha was showing, sorry, <laughs> when Eha was showing earlier the um, gauges, and you could see the hind pass and the forecast, one of the things that this is going to help us do is calibrate the models. So you can see that we missed, you know, the models that we're using right now were some of the core models and those that were, were created um, in 2006, 2007. So those models were created to for big storm events, for the 100-year event. And so you'll see that it's capturing big storms, but the little ones were missing. So this will help further calibrate and get, get those models fine-tuned as we go forward. So I just wanted to add, so everybody kind of understands, we've kind of reached the end of this particular phase of this contract, so the thing is up now and running and working. You know, we, we, had, we went through this, we got a lot on the agenda today to try and get through without trying to train everybody on views. But the bottom line is there's dashboards that are sitting on our staff's computers that every day they're watching these things and they're monitoring it. And now as that data is beginning to flow in and they're building confidence in the results, we'll get to a point where we'll focus on how to dispatch that information to others. So there's a lot of really a lot of high technology ways that we're going to try and embrace that uh, through uh, Azure and some Markview products, even possibly some apps that we can generate where this information is ultimately provided out. It's our OEP offices, our, our, our municipalities, whoever needs it. <coughs> so at the parish level, we're not necessarily wanting to be in the uh, alert business. We want to provide the information, let those agencies that focus on what to do with that information a little more. Uh, for us internally, we want to use it to look at that daily dashboard for projects that we can identify areas. You know, you have highlighted that one area that obviously was at flooding that day. That's how we want to use it more than anything to target projects to those areas where you see a lot of blue on the map. So hats off to these guys for, uh, this is a, a very dynamic field. Uh, uh, there's a couple versions that's now going around the country and it's growing. Uh, arena, but to be where we're at, we're set up, I think, in a way that we can really uh, capture all this and begin to expand it. And 
probably learn a few things along the way, but uh, I think Capital Two Parish will hopefully be positioned to have an outstanding system to do what we need to do going forward. Yes. So thank you all for all the hard work, really. Um, any questions? You keep referring back to water elevations. Are you going to actually get that in six inch depth in the street? Or are you going to because there's always been a lot of confusion from the weather service about storm surge and how that's going to work. Uh, I, I'm on board with this. This is great. Uh, I'm very proud to be living in Calcasieu Parish. Uh, I think y'all are going to get some national recognition and it's well deserved. But my concern is when you eventually put this out to the public, will they receive it and understand it and not just be confused? Which one? Um, uh, go to the one that's uh, the refined one with the, uh, the, the refined version of the snapshot. Yeah, there was a snapshot of it that showed keep going down. Not this yeah. one, but the other one, the refined version of that. So, Mike, I think that's a there great question. This one? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really good question. And, and, you know, this is, this, is, this, you know, Dennis and I were talking about this yesterday. One of the things we want to be able to do is be able to zoom in right here and be able to illustrate and, and you know everybody's used google enough now google maps enough to know how to drop the little man on the spot right and, and have that convert over to a water elevation um, predicted of course yep. on a known structure uh, a, a landmark that we all recognize so we have a lot a lot of ideas on how to begin to push this out but there is that backside question of you know accuracy, validity, how people are going to react to their information. That's why we're not rushing to that delivery. We're still in a, a pilot program, having the data and, and understanding what to do with it and how to use it best is something we're still developing. So, uh, but we have a lot of ideas on how to get this out uh, and, and, and make it available to people who need it. But it is a little early to say we're going to you know, uh, in the next two weeks, you start seeing us making forecasts for local street flooding, but we're headed in the right direction, and we have, you know, plenty of ways to try and uh, promote the information and, and, and create that self-awareness, that self-education, where you can go and understand what's happening on your street, you know, and make your own decisions. So, good question. Any other questions on Fuse before? They get off the, well, I guess we're going we're gonna to contact them. Uh, I'll let, I'll let y'all handle this, but uh, we'll probably eat lunch or get our lunch at least and come back and start in on the, this overall study itself. Any other questions? Everybody wants to be hungry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a show. Sure. Calcasieu Parish has thousands of miles of channels that are the responsibility of drainage districts, the parish, the various municipalities. But we've got to start thinking beyond those political boundaries. We have to start thinking more on a watershed basis. So there's a lot of area, as can be seen here, that comes through Calcasieu Parish. If Calcasieu Parish only had to worry about Calcasieu Parish's water, it really wouldn't be a problem. But we also have to worry about everything coming from the north, as well as things coming even down the Sabine. So we have to work beyond our boundaries. And that, that's kind of where even the state is going, and Danica is going to talk about it a little bit. We have to start thinking watershed now. So what makes a successful plan. When we first started this, one of the key components here was that this plan needed to be adapted. It wasn't just what projects do we need to put on the ground, but we need to talk about policy, we need to talk about programs, we need to talk about how will this be implemented, both short-term and long-term goals. We also need to talk about what happens if what we foresee the future to be doesn't happen. 
Or what if we grow faster than we ever expected? That's where Calcutta Parish is at right now. Rapid growth. Another main thing is the cooperation of agencies, cooperation with jurisdictions. So Dennis spoke earlier. This is working with your neighbors. It's working with Borobor Parish, working with Allen Parish, working with Cameron Parish. Because what you do here impacts them and vice versa. So the plan needs to be adaptive. It needs to reflect change. But this plan will go through, right now we're in the planning. We're going to look at projects, engineering, and construction. We continue to monitor. We need to continue to adjust. So one of the ways to do this is we teamed with Del Taras out of the Netherlands. Um, and they have implemented what's called Dynamic Adaptive Policy Pathways. Short, we call it DAP. And what this is, it's a process that looks at these uncertainties. It looks at the what ifs. It also looks at short term goals and long term goals. And it, it's not new. It's been implemented in San Francisco, Miami, the Netherlands, Australia, so and most recently LA, Los Angeles. So this is something that when we teamed with them, we're like, how what is some good ideas? And this is exactly that because it looks at the adaptivity of a plan. So right now we're at the beginning. Um, right now, we are looking at, you know, gathering the data, looking at goals and objectives, defining those, and then we have also embarked now on the data collection as well as the modeling. And that's what we're going to present to you all today. So, kind of what we've completed, where we're at right now, and then we're going to cover a little bit of where we're going. So, we started off with your guiding principles. These are the guiding principles that you, as a parish, adopted, um, I think in 2015 or 2016. So these included protecting your public and private investments, um, optimizing economic growth, uh, reducing potential for, of impacts from natural disasters, protecting your water resources for future generations, and maximizing the efficiencies of your watershed. So these are your guiding principles, and this is where we thought was a good place to start. Um, I want to highlight the protect public and private investments. So the image you see here, some of y'all have seen it already. Um, the lower image, this is a FEMA flood map. And nice zone X. What most people know of zone X is, hey, I'm not in a flood zone. I don't need flood insurance. I don't need a build up. That's the development that builds in that flood zone. This is why policy is important. This is why it's important that as communities, we ensure that we're not just regulating on those flood maps. Because those flood maps look at things from a high level. That they look at the major channels, the major streams. They don't look at the lateral that runs behind my house that eventually makes its way to the Calcasieu River. So that neighborhood flooded. We can protect these people. We have the technology. We have the resources. And this is kind of where we're going. So the next step in our decision context step was our stakeholders. There's lots of stakeholders that need to be involved. Some of y'all in this room we've met with. Leasers, mayors, the drainage districts, um, also non-government organizations, your emergency preparedness, big one other parishes. We haven't gotten there yet. We're getting there. I think Dennis has already started that communication, but th this is kind of where we're, we're going. Um, state and federal agencies, Danica is here today to kind of talk, talk through that process. So stakeholder involvement is still a key component, and, and we began this. In July, we held a workshop. Some of y'all were here, and we said, okay, we know our guiding principles. Well, what's our goal? What's the objective of this project? And we gave y'all a list, and we asked y'all to rank them. So, the results. Um, this is how y'all ranked your goals and objectives. Um, reduce vulnerability for extreme events. Reducing vulnerability of cr critical infrastructure. Leveraging past and current watershed projects. Improving your quality of life. Enhancing economic growth and development. And preparedness toward coastal impacts. So this is how they were ranked. 
Um, they're also important. They're also our goals. They kind of helped us to kind of see what, what was most important. What are we What are we aiming for in in this project? Um, so the images here. I'm going to show y'all the upper one. That's your flood map of an area here in Capuchin Parish, and the lower one. This is a cut and fill. So this is using the old lidar from 1999, the new lidar. And you can see the green areas are what's been cut. They've taken the ponds, and the yellow areas are what has been elevated. So the important thing is, yeah, cut and fill looks like it balanced pretty good here. But one question is, well, is that fill high enough? Was it, did these houses build up enough? Was there enough cut and fill? These are things that we're, we're talking about, about protecting vulnerable structures, protecting infrastructure that this is kind of where we're going on this plan. Um, for those in attendance at the work, last workshop, we did a shockers and stressors exercise. So we looked at the shockers. A shocker is something that happens immediately and, and really gives a shock to your infrastructure or your, um, just in general, your drainage. So we asked, what are, what are some of the, we gave a list of shockers and asked y'all to rank them. And the tallies are here. Some of the ones that ranked on top was uh, drainage and infrastructure failure really have a big shock on your system. Rapid development. Y'all are feeling this right now. Y'all have been feeling it for a couple of years. And I don't have to tell you what it's doing. Extreme rainfall and severe storms. This is one y'all added because we had a, you know, a nice other category. Upstream floods, dam releases, south winds, high tides. This is something that causes a shock to you, to Calcasieu Parish. Somebody in Shreveport, that doesn't matter. But to, here in Calcasieu Parish, that's what matters to you. So th this is a shock. And then tropical storms and hurricanes. They don't have that frequent, at least we hope not. Um, but when they hit, they definitely cause a shock to our system. Um, stressors are small things that with time, they impact your, your system. So some of the things that came up was public education. Does the public understand, one, what they're doing and how it impacts their drainage? Well, do they understand what the policies mean and why the policies are in place for them? So educating the public. Sometimes it's, a, it's felt that there's a lack of understanding about why things are there or why things may take so long. Do they understand that it takes you must get the, uh, a permit from the poor, you know, an understanding from them. Um, another thing is vulnerable, critical infrastructure, uh, sewer plants, things like that. They, these are things that people don't think about, but they can cause a stress on the system when they go down. And uh, increases in FEMA and flood insurance. You know, we all feel that, you pay homeowners insurance, you pay flood insurance. These are stressors on our system. So after our workshop, through the goals and objectives, discussions, um, we kind of prioritized where we were going to start with this watershed plan. Similar to what we discussed in, earlier this morning, uh, we started off as a pilot study in the contraband. So we also looked and said, well, where do we begin here? So we first looked and we said, we're going to start with the Lake Charles watershed and the Sulphur watershed in year one. And this is a, a four year plan. Each year, we'll kind of pick up the other watersheds as we go through. Well, interestingly, those why were these chosen? There are a couple of things we looked at: population. Uh, we also looked at repetitive losses. We looked at a lot of things. One thing is they're isolated watersheds. They're not really dependent on others. You know, Ward One, we start having to interact with Board Ward. So these are things we can get done quickly. So we wanted to make sure, and they also had projects in those areas that we could leverage as well. So the next step is we looked and started doing data collection. Um, Jim with CSRS has already started meeting with a lot of y'all. Um, he's looking for studies, plans, capital improvement projects, both past and future. We've also been pulling repetitive loss, flood history. Um, and we're also starting to go in the field and look at field conditions themselves. Tying this together with your gauging system, which is extremely important. You saw how it was being used this morning with the real-time forecasting. You currently are operating 82 gauges. 
these are rainfall and stage gauges. We're looking to put another 40 on. Um, these gauges are very instrumental in calibrating the modeling. They're very instrumental in the real-time forecasting that was presented this morning. But we've also been working with the parish to say where should they be located? What is the prime location to put them? As well as looking at are there areas that we can put other types of gauges? We'd love to see some flow gauges out there. Those would really help. So these are things we're working with the parish on right now. So the next step is let's start assessing the vulnerability. We gathered the data, we set our goals, we set our objectives. So now we're moving into the fun one, the modeling. So like we mentioned earlier, in 2006 to 2010, Capuchin Parish made a big investment and did a lot of 1D modeling. So why don't we just take those 1D models? What's wrong with them? Well, nothing, but there's a lot of assumptions that go into those models. There's a lot of things that have changed since those models were created. Um, a lot of development. Uh, Y'all thought about the new LIDAR. Um, another thing that's changed is 2D modeling has become a lot cheaper. It used to cost $25,000 for a single license, and the minute I'd run a model, it would take 12 hours for me to get results. Now, these models are running really quickly. Um, the core now has software for 2D modeling. And the best part of 2D modeling is it eliminates a lot of the assumptions we have to make. It takes the topography, the LIDAR, where we used to have to interpret between cross-sections every 500 feet, 700 feet. Now that overbank is a surface. Um, we can say grids on it or land use. A lot of assumptions are out of the way, so it makes the modeling more accurate. This is really good. So this is kind of our suggestion and where we're progressing is 2D modeling. Um, this kind of shows what we're doing. We're taking your LIDAR that was just taken. We're taking the 1D models that you've already paid for and created, and we're merging the two together. So we're using these two models, bringing it together, and we're going to start looking at 2D floodplain modeling. This can then be taken and placed into the real-time forecasting and getting more accurate results. Another nice thing about 2D modeling is it kind of takes a lot of the guessing work out of interbase and exchange. We're extremely flat around here. So one of the things that 1D modeling is you literally go in and you set boundaries. You set where the limits of that model will run. With 2D modeling, we don't have to make as many assumptions I mentioned earlier. But a good one is that we don't have to figure out where the water goes. The topography helps us do that. So when we first sat down with the parish, we said, okay, well, let's start. Sit Lake Charles Basin. We started kind of scratching our heads like, well, looks like Lake Charles kind of interacts with the Coyote Cooey and East McNeese. And what about Black Bayou? You started seeing the connectivity. Fine, this is great. This is what 2D modeling is about. But what it's done is kind of expanded our footprint a little bit. So right now, we're currently setting up a model it includes Lake Charles, East McNeese, and South Ward 3. That'll be your first 2D model. We're also still moving forward. Jim's meeting with the, going to start meeting with those in the Sulphur Basin, gathering data and moving forward so we can begin setting up <coughs> the west side of the river. Once we have these models set up, we're going to start running different alternatives. We're going to start running different conditions. Some of the things we're going to look at is what are the impacts of sea level rise, subsidence? What does that do to the models in 10 years, in 50 years? We're going to be looking at a 50-year horizon. What happens if our growth rate is this value or that? So we're going to start looking at not just the high, but we're going to look at low, medium, and high. Then once we have those models, we're going to start analyzing projects. Once we start looking at projects, this is where the DAP analysis comes in. It's kind of like a subway map, like a metro map, where you can come in and say, okay, well, some projects, they're easy to implement, but they're quite expensive. Others, they're easy to implement, but they take a really long time to maybe permit or to get land acquisition. 
So you can start looking at where do these things fall, which projects can be implemented for short-term and long-term goals. It also allows us to quickly say, well, what if we don't grow that fast? What happens if growth slows down? What if growth exceeds our expectations? We can start moving things around and seeing which projects make sense. But most importantly, which projects can be implemented that do not harm downstream or another watershed. So that, that's important. What we do today, you want to make sure that, yeah, I get the water out of here. I can concrete line that channel and get it out of here really fast. But all it does is push that water downstream. So it lets you start to see what's happening and how you're impacting people within your watershed. Um, another thing that we're doing as part of the watershed plan is a watershed report card. So currently, the NAM nation and the state, both using the American Society of Civil Engineers, do a report card of our infrastructure. They look at bridges. They look at roads. They look at water, sewer. They do not look at drainage. So Alan says, why not? Let's do it. Thought it was a great idea, so we're working on it. For each watershed, we're going to use the same grading scale, just like you get a report card for your kids. Same, we're using the same level, so exceptional fit for future to failing critical unfit for its purpose. So we're going to use the same categories. But we're going to look at a little different criteria. Some of the things we're going to look at is capacity. So what is the capacity of this channel? We're not saying what it is, but we're going to say what is the goal? So depending on the size of a channel, whether it's a major channel or an intermediate channel, an intermediate channel, we may say in Calcasieu Parish, all of our intermediate channels that drain X acres need to carry a 10-year storm. Well, EHAP's team is going to do the modeling and tell me, did it carry the 10-year storm? Maybe a major channel that is over 3,000 acres draining to it is classified as major, and it needs to carry a 25-year storm. Well, the models are going to say, does it carry a 25-year storm? And we're going to give it a grade based on that. The other thing we're going to look at is how built out is that watershed? Is that watershed at 90% capacity? Is it completely built out? Is it at 30? You know, how much room does it have to grow and still use the system that it has? Where do we need to look at? Other things we're going to look at are bridges, culverts, pumps, not looking at them to tell you what kind of condition they're in. I'm looking to tell you, do, are they hydraulically adequate for what their function is? Does that culvert operate per DOTD specifications? Do those pumps operate like they should? This will also help us identify where we may need additional assistance. Other things we're going to look at are resiliency and vulnerability. So asset and inter infrastructure protection, do you have a wastewater treatment plant that is in a flood zone? What happens if it floods? Do you have a lift station that that control panel goes underwater? What happens? What goes down? So these are things that flooding impacts that we need to look at and assess. Other things we're looking at are regulations, drainage and development ordinances. Freeboard protection ordinances, right of way and servitude availability. These are all things that impact those that live in this watershed. And so we're going to use that to evaluate. So um, we're starting the criteria. We're going to start on each watershed. So each of your 10 watersheds within the parish will be getting a grade. Um, and we'll be meeting with y'all. We're not just going to give you that grade. We're going to talk to y'all kind of understand your system. This is this is part of the stakeholder involvement here. One of my favorite pictures. Wait, great planning. That actually is in downtown Baton Rouge. Not quite sure how that happened. I was hoping you wouldn't say Calvary. It's not it's just your parents. It's down, you know, it's like, the only problem is that the cat that's right. <laughs> that's our problem. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but uh, it, it, it's one of those fun ones, you know, fun planning <laughs> happened there. Um, so <laughs> we're going to go on. Uh, so public education, we talked about this earlier. Um, people often say, what is the community, what is the government doing for me? What's going on? Those who work 
the government knows there's a lot going on. Y'all are cleaning ditches. Y'all are cleaning culverts. Sometimes the, the, the equipment that's moving is happening downstream where nobody lives, so they don't think you're doing anything, but, but it really is happening. And so there's what's called ArcGIS hubs and story maps. Um, these are set up. Uh, they run through Esri. Uh, Y'all have a great GIS backbone. <coughs> Fantastic, one of the best in the state. Let's utilize it. It's already there. Um, these hubs and story maps are great. I'm gonna pull up one or two in a little bit. Um, the, the hub is more based for interaction between the government, government letting the communities know what's going on. And it also has like sounding boards where people can go and post things on um, or put a report in, kind of like a reporting agency. Um, a story map, uh, the CPRA actually uses story mapping for the master plan and for some of their stuff. Um, story mapping can also be used to, it's kind of an easy read for the community. It's not a fancy map that people have to start checking things on and at all. Um, it tells you a story. So I'm gonna pull up two that are pretty, give you an idea. All right, so this one is can be utilized for projects. Um, these are just examples that they have. As I click, you can see things change up a little bit. You can actually put any data you want on here. This is showing before and after of some street projects that were done. Um, you can include the cost. You can put status. You can show um, you know, where we're at, if it's in a design, if it's been constructed. So you can basically update the public. This does require updates. <laughs> so it does require a staff member to participate in uh, keeping people informed. Um, but this is becoming the, the basis of how a lot of communities are um, educating and keeping, I don't like the word education really, it's more keeping people involved keeping them knowing what's going on. They went here, they're interested. They're participating. They want to know. So um, this is another one. This one's done in Township, Pennsylvania. So this is what a storyboard is. It's just, you can scroll through, kind of pops up with some educational components, pops up with some mapping. You can see how the channels start to populate. Kind of gets a little more detailed with some extra data so like it's a little easier read a little way to but you can also post um, videos you can show timelines you can show um, there's a lot of different key components that you can add to these hubs so this is the definitely the direction that we're looking at going we think it's the most user-friendly um, so that, that's something that we wanted to show and share with y'all. Y'all still have y'all GIS network. People can still go to the GIS and pull up and definitely get in, but they can also go here and pull up reports. Um, they can pull up status. They can pull up meetings and things like that. So it's a little friendlier way. All right. So I'm gonna about to turn it over to Danica. Um, She's going to be talking to you a little bit about the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. So this is a statewide initiative. Um, I've asked her to come and tell you kind of what it is, um, how you can participate. She's going to give you all some dates, please. Write down those dates. They're doing workshops here in Lake Charles. It's a great opportunity for you all to participate. And um, after she's done, we're going to kind of talk about a little bit of how does this impact how she perish and where do we fit in this plan into what the state's doing? And we'll kind of start that dialogue. So, Danica, if you want to step up. Mike. Thank you. Oh, let me yeah. put my... This down. This. And you can behind or if you want to use just this mic it's up to you okay hey guys my name is Danica Adams I work for the Office of Community Development uh, with the state and we're currently part of a
coalition uh, of state agencies. It's actually the Council on Watershed Management, and I'm here to talk to you a bit about what's going on at the state level and when we're going to be coming um, to y'all to hear what's going on here, although I've gotten an incredible amount of really solid information today, and you have a lot going on. So um, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and ask me if it's just a clarification question, or you can also hold questions till the end. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of um, overlap between what y'all are already embarking on and, and what we're going to be working on in the future. Um, or what we've already started trying to start working on. Um, like I said, I work for the Office of Community Development. It's one of five agencies that's part of the Council on Watershed Management. It's the Office of Community Development, um, and I'll use all the acronyms because I, I think y'all got them. Um, so OCD, that's me, I'm totally OCD. Uh, DOTD, CPRA, GOSAP, which is the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, and Department of Wildlife and Fisheries have all joined forces to sort of start reducing flood risk across the state. So the Louisiana Watershed Initiative is one of these initiatives that is actually very critical. We saw the need for it in 2016 when, place, when twice across the state there were communities that were flooded with multiple feet of water that had never flooded before. Um, the majority of disasters in Louisiana are flood related. And of course, something, a truism that we all know is that water does not at all respect our political jurisdictions and our political boundaries. So places that are hydrologically connected need to be able to plan together and act together and react together. Um, so actions in one community can affect areas, you know, upstream, downstream, and to all of the sides of uh, where that event actually took place. And this is true for both um, sort of policy-based decisions as well as infrastructure-based decisions. And then, of course, you know, the way that water flows across watersheds can um, impacts or impacts and interacts with the built environment. Uh, sort of across all of those political jurisdictions. Oh, there you go. Oh, good. <laughs> I, uh, I thought I broke it. <laughs> I've been told that technology hates me. It's not a mutual feeling. Though. Um, the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, we used to actually call this uh, the Louisiana Comprehensive Statewide Watershed-Based Floodplain Management Program. <laughs> Uh, so at some point someone thought we should make it shorter, you know, I think this name rings true, the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, and it has two goals, uh, reduce flood risk across the state and include, improve floodplain management across the state. Um, both of those two goals end up with the state of Louisiana in a place of increased resilience to natural disasters, and of course, in our world of flooding, what we're talking about resilience, we're talking about reduced instances of disasters, reduced impacts from disasters, improved response to disasters, and improved recovery after a disaster. Um, we're taking a dual approach to achieving these missions, or this mission of flood risk reduction. The first one is within sort of the state agency purview. We have a lot of agencies and a lot of programs and a lot of authorities located within state agencies. And if those were aligned towards a single goal of reducing flood risk across the state, there would be an immense, um, we'd be able to leverage all of the powers of those state agencies combined. So we're working now towards aligning those existing programs and policies and practices towards flood risk reduction at the state level while also on the community level moving towards this watershed-based floodplain management program so that we can support communities who want to make decisions you know, um, across the political boundaries or across parishes or across municipalities within their watershed so that those hydrologically con connected communities can, um, can make joint decisions and, and actually impact uh, their flood risk in a positive way. So 
Uh, just a brief timeline. Right after the 2016 floods, the governor came to us and said, hey guys, you know, we can do better than this. We are here to protect our citizens. We're here to protect all areas of the state. And I need y'all to start working together to make sure that that happens. So, um, where's the, yeah. Governor Edwards directed these state agencies to start coordinating programs and aligning efforts toward flood risk <laughs> mitigation. Um, around that same time, or shortly thereafter, uh, a mod uh, an h and model for the Amy watershed started to begin development, and that was out of a totally separate initiative. And then we began also phase one of the development of this program. Um, in 2018, the beginning of 2018, the Council on Watershed Management was formally established through an executive order, and all of those five cooperating agencies released a, um, it's essentially the phase one document that outlines this multi-phase approach and the multi-pronged approach uh, towards flood risk reduction across the state. In 2019, we are finalizing the framework and we are currently going through the state to communities um, at every corner of the state trying to get information from people who are doing this, people who want to be doing this, in order to help inform what this framework looks like. So this is not a finalized, this is not a fully baked program yet. There is still a lot of opportunity to weigh in and impact the, um, the way that this rolls out across the state. So when we were doing the phase one investigation of what this program could or should include, we identified six critical areas. And it's these critical areas that um, are, it's these areas that are absolutely necessary to make a program that does the thing that we want it to do, which is reduce flood risk across the state. So step number one, no matter what, is we need data. Y'all have a lot of data right now and you're ahead of the state in a lot of ways. But what we need are relevant living models and other sorts of data in each of the watersheds, and there are 59 in the state, in each of the watersheds that are able to be used for land use decision making, policy decision making, and project evaluation. So we need information that we can stand on when we're making decisions about how to interact with our environment. But we can have all the data in the world if this engagement piece, and, and it won't matter at all if this engagement piece is not hit. So if the stakeholders are not engaged, if you're not out there ground truthing the data, if you're not telling us what is and is not true from your experience, if those high water marks that you have don't match the high water, water marks that we have, um, then the data is not gonna be as relevant and then if, if this engagement piece is missing and everything is happening from the state and doesn't involve the local communities, then the initiative itself is missing the mark. And those community-based or those watershed-based community coalitions are not gonna be um, as effective and they're not gonna be able to maximize all of the powers that you have located here. Um, there's also an idea of standards and state leadership um, there are some things that could be consistent across the state in order to ease that uh, data approach. We also need a lot of alignment and a lot of funding, and that's something that we are working on and that we have, a, we have um, I can tell you a bit more about it in just a second, but the, the funding allocation that the state has received, which is $1.2 billion, will take us a long way. But at the end of the day, this is a stone soup situation, right? We're gonna need all hands on deck, we're gonna need everyone throwing in all of the capabilities and all of the capacities that they have in order to make this work in every municipality, in every village, in every parish, in every watershed, and across the state. Because it's that together, it's those actions together that make up those flood risk resilience, um, the overarching flood risk resilience. Um, and that brings me to this capability and capacity. 
we want to be able to support our municipalities and our parishes, and we want to be able to support the watershed coalitions that are being built. Um, and so we want to be able to bring some additional staff skills and tools into the areas that need it, um, provide technical assistance in order to get you where you want to be, and then integrate planning into each one of those things. Um, I realize I've talked a lot longer on this slide than I meant to because I get really excited about all six of these areas. I think they're all really critical. Right now, we're still in this data phase and we're starting on the engagement, um, but all six of these are absolutely necessary in order to get us where we want to be, right? We have to have all of those. And we're just at the very beginning right now. But we're working on it. We're getting there. Um, and again, there's this emphasis on engagement that's, that is sort of the key to um, that flood risk reduction or that floodplain management. Um, right now, we are in the middle of a statewide listening tour. We have, um, we've been to Lafayette, we've been to Monroe, Alexandria, and Shreveport. Today, everyone else is in HOMA, and um, they're talking a lot about these ecological and biological impacts. And then our next stop is here in Lake Charles on November 7th, talking about modeling approaches. A brief note about these workshops. There's a morning session that is a deep dive into data. And there's an afternoon session that's uh, about, it's about policy, it's about projects, and it's about planning. And we're going to want to have you there for all of the, that full day so that we can know um, what data you have, what you're currently doing, what projects are in the works, what data gaps exist, what data do you need in order to do the good work that you're doing, and then also to take it to the next step of once you have that data, how can we talk about projects? How can we talk about planning for the future? And how can we talk about policy in order to make those impacts last? So um, please, 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 and if you want to give me one of your cards, I can add you to our mailing list. But we really would like to see you at least at this November 7th meeting here in Lake Charles. We'll be talking about modeling approaches and transition zones. So how the, the coastal zones and the inland, inland zones can interact in an H&H &H model. Um, and now, how can you integrate into this watershed initiative? I would say the first step is to attend and participate in the listening session. And when I say participate, we're going to ask people to sign up to speak for five to ten minutes about initiatives that are happening here about projects that are going on here, about needs that you have here associated with data and reducing flood risk. So participate in that session. Tell us what you need. Tell us what you're already doing. Um, help us understand all of your ongoing planning efforts. Help us understand your existing funding sources so that we can make sure that those are leveraged and not tapped out. Help us understand your flood risk reduction project needs and your policy needs and then help us spread the word and make sure that the right people are at the table. So I did want to just mention that y'all have an incredible amount of really good work that's going on here. Uh, like I mentioned, I, I heard it earlier, and I'm gonna, I've been hearing about it, and I wanted to just uh, commend you for all of the sort of political will that that takes. Um, you're doing a lot of really good work, and we're here to support you. And we're here to listen to what you need and what we can do to make sure that that good work continues over time. Um, watershed at la.gov is actively monitored. So send us an email, and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. It's usually within a day. Um, we're, we're here to answer your questions. I know I talked a lot, and I probably went over my time. I'm sorry about that. I wanted to ask, since y'all have been in uh, four metros so far, what are one or two takeaways that you're seeing that maybe you could share with the group? Well, that's, a, that's actually a really good question, and it's a really interesting question. I guarantee you that my takeaway is going to be different than 
you know, anyone else is on the team, and we're, we all have very different takeaways at this point. The thing that has stuck out to me is that um, at this point, every single area that we've talked to has wildly different existing capacities and wildly, exist, wildly different um, approaches to the problem. But every single area is trying very hard to reduce their flood risk, and they're all going about it very differently, and they all have very, very, very different um, capabilities and resources at their fingertips. And so developing a statewide approach is, is necessary and it's gonna happen. And also, there, the, the idea of the watershed-based planning process is that the areas, the, the parishes that make up the watersheds, and when I say watershed, I'm mostly referring to a Huck 8 level, which is a lot larger than those watersheds within a city. It, they'll actually be uh, multiple parishes that make up a Huck 8 watershed. Um, the watershed planning process is going to have to be context appropriate and context sensitive. It's gonna to have to come from the local parishes and municipalities, and it's gonna to have to take into account the local economy, the local um, social structure, and all of the resources that you have. And so there will need to be an overarching statewide approach that's then refined on the watershed level. And your hook eight is how Schumer Questions? Um, I've got a sign-in sheet here. If y'all would all please sign in, we will um, forward this to Danica. That way she has contacts of those here. Can keep y'all informed, put y'all on the mailing list. Um, one thing I want to point out is y'all heard where we're at from a parish standpoint. You see where the state is going. Um, we're not sure of the overlap yet. We're, we don't know. Um, we are working closely with Danica and her group following y'all participation. Um, we want to make sure that we don't overlap, but we also want to make sure we close any gaps. Like you said, some things may be on a higher level from a modeling standpoint, um, and we may change scope a little bit in the next year. But we're going to continue to monitor this. We're going to continue to work with the state and uh, ensure that Couch your Parish is on the right path. Because we are. We are on that path. We just want to keep going and make the best use of uh, what's coming our way from the state. I echo her. Please, I did the workshop and laugh yet. Please participate. There is an elected officials um, session. Those elected officials, please go. It's important that you go. It's important because they're talking policy. There is a potential that the state is looking at policy that can come down. What does that mean to Capuchin Parish? Y'all are at the forefront of this. Y'all have great policy in place. They're learning. They're asking, what's working for you? What's not working for you? So please, your participation is extremely important. Um, Dennis, I'm gonna let you uh, kind of close or run um, or Alan. <laughs> Somebody wants to do closing statement. I definitely uh, wanted to, uh, we'll give it to Dennis, just say, so I want to reiterate, First off, we have our entire team here. I want to thank Mr. Mayor. Great job with this, John, everybody. But, uh, you know, if there's any questions now, especially for this team, we're going to be here. We have actually some working meetings after this uh, on, the, on the watershed effort. But if there's any questions for us, um, take the opportunity. If you don't want to raise your hand, you write it on one of these steps. Be sure we know who you are. We'll uh, be glad to try and get back with you. But. Thanks everybody for coming. We hope we went through a lot of information, tried to pack it all into as short a period of time as we could, and uh, to catch everybody up on what we're doing. And uh, with that, we'll close. Dennis, if you, like I said, last few words. Appreciate it. I have a question for every screen, but I'm going to spare you all that. But there's two quick things that I would like to just make a statement on. When we're talking 1,500, 100 year floods, statistically now, a 100 year flood is a 25 year flood. So why aren't we beginning to recalibrate our thinking according to what, I don't say the CC word because it's not good for us, but I do know reoccurring extreme weather events. I don't know why they happen and I don't care. I know they happen. So we have to recalibrate how we lay out these plans 
And the second thing is, I hear 1.2 billion, and I know in resilience talk, if I spend a dollar, I save six dollars in recovery. So if you're seeing something like this happening really amazing, that dollar should be spent right now or in the middle of this. And I understand 26 million in the Lafayette region is phenomenal, and we need that watershed study, but if we're doing it here, it seems like there ought to be some way to look and say, hey, let me infuse a little bit of money right now because I'm going to have to do it later. Just, uh, just an extra statement. So thank you for coming. You know, resilience is where we're heading. It is about the vulnerability. What is resilience? We want to be able to plan, prepare, absorb, and adapt so that we can recover. All of this is going to turn into something bigger, I assure you. When we start putting together long-term recovery plans, all the things that will grow out of this, our community is going to be more resilient. This will draw down federal dollars. The sooner and faster we get this taken care of, the more champions we have in a room expressing these. The storylines are amazing when that begins to take shape because I act like I understand a lot of this, but the storylines and the visibilities, not the charts and the graphs, the storylines make a difference. So we all have different resources. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for Couch Shoe Parish, Brian, your team that you've assembled to do this. Alan, you're learning some stuff. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for this guy right here, man. Appreciate it. Al, Shelly, thank y'all for coming.